Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our second education book discussion. Today's guest is John Rose, the author of Until Our Minds Rest in Thee, Open-Minded, Open-Mindedness, Intellectual Diversity in the Christian Life. I can already tell that I'm going to stumble over that word over and over again. Um, this is a new series that we've launched and I'm glad you were able to make it. We'll continue to host education book discussions every other month with authors of recent and sort of recent books about higher education or higher education uh, adjacent topics. Um, thank you to our viewers and our donors for making events like this possible. I'm Jenna Robinson, president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. The Martin Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to higher education reform. We advocate responsible governance, viewpoint diversity, academic quality, cost-effective education solutions, and innovative market-based reform. Uh, before we get started with today's talk, I want to let you know that we'll be hosting our next event in this series in February. We don't have it up on our website yet, but be on the lookout. And I will hand over the floor to John shortly, but I want to take one minute to tell you how this event will run. First, John will talk for about 20 minutes about his book. Uh, then John and I will have a short discussion. And after that, I will start posing questions from the audience. And so if you're viewing this, you can actually post a question by using the Q&A icon at any time. Um, I'll pose questions to John at the end of the discussion, but you can put those in at any time. Um, and viewers on Facebook, simply post your questions in the comments section and we'll monitor those as well. Also, I wanna let everyone know that we are recording this event so you can watch it later or share it online. And now I will introduce today's guest. John Rose is the Associate Director of the Arate Initiative, which is part of the Keenan Center for Ethics at Duke University. The Arate Initiative sponsors courses, lectures, conferences, and research that concern the pressing questions of meaning, value, and spirit that confront us as human beings and citizens, which really sounds like the definition of what higher education is all about anyway. Um, but in addition to helping coordinate Arate's programming, Dr. Rose teaches courses in happiness and human flourishing, Christian ethics, conservatism, and political polarization. His research concerns the tradition of virtue ethics and Christian theology. John holds a BA in religion from Wabash College, an MTS from Duke Divinity School, and a PhD from theology in theology from Princeton Theological Seminary. Welcome, John, and I will let you get started. Thank you so much. I'm flattered that you would ask me here. Um, this is only the second time I've been asked to ever speak about my book. Um, and so thank you. Um, well, we're like thrilled to have you. Yeah, <laughs> well, great. Well, great. Um, so I, I thought I'd begin by explaining how I came to write the book. Um, it was it, the result of my dissertation, uh, which went by the same title. I wrote at Princeton Seminary. Um, I noticed, like many of us today, that there was a good deal of tribalism in our country and in our institutions of higher education. Um, there was a lot of talk of open-mindedness, but I didn't see a lot of that. Um, we're big on diversity, but the one kind of diversity that we seem to be a little less uh, celebratory about was viewpoint diversity, something you mentioned, Jenna. Uh, when you described the uh, mission statement of the James Martin Center. And so I was thinking about this uh, as a virtue ethicist, saying like, well, if open-mindedness really is a virtue, and I wasn't sure when I started, is it, is it or is it not? Uh, like, under what definition would it be? Would it meet the standards of Aristotle? Would it meet the standards of Aquinas? Should a Christian be open-minded? And if so, in what sense? And similarly, uh, with viewpoint diversity, um, why, 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 why think it has value? What kind of value does it have? Um, does it have objective value in itself? Is it an end in itself or is it instrumental? And if so, why think that is the case? And then as with open-mindedness, I said, well, let's take the next step and say, if you are a Christian, does that make a difference to how you view viewpoint diversity? Or what I call intellectual diversity meaning a lived encounter with either people or texts that uh, disagree with your view, okay? Um, and following 
Aquinas's way of doing business, I spent the first half of the dissertation and then eventually the book um, looking at these things through a purely philosophical lens. Now, some Christian thinkers say, don't, don't do that. Um, you just skip right to the theology. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I tell them, um, if you want to skip to part two of the book, just do that. Um, but the, Aquinas says you can learn about things, especially virtues, by looking at them from the standpoint of philosophy and using Aristotle. Um, and then ask yourself the additional question, what difference does grace make? Okay, so the special virtues uh, that we get from Paul mentioned uh, in the Bible, faith, hope, and love, and charity above all. When those things are added to the, um, you know, the natural virtues of the fortitude, temperance, prudence, and these things, those virtues look different. And right? they take on a special form, they're, they're completed, they're exalted. That's what grace does. Okay, so I thought, well, what if I were to try to figure out if open-mindedness meets the standards of Aristotle? And then if you had faith, how would that look different? And what I discovered going through the thought process was that a lot of the things that we might think would be open-minded, open-mindedness, like definitions you might give, or you just stop somebody on the street and say, what do you think open-mindedness is? Or the way, if you look at like the way we, in our speech, how we sort of refer to it, what we mean by it, I, I, I concluded that those things couldn't be virtues. They just couldn't be. Um, they couldn't represent a, you know, there are several definitions you can give of virtue. And I don't, generally one of the things you want me to do is define it. It's, it's a little bit slippery, um, but it, a sort of disposition of the soul. Um, is a virtue ethicist think about um, um, virtue in terms of a habit. So it's a settled disposition towards doing uh, the right thing for the right reason and feeling the right emotions when you do it. Okay, so it's not enough just to visit grandma because you're trying to impress your girlfriend. Um, it's not full on virtue if when you're visiting grandma, you hate it. Uh, you got to take pleasure in the right things for the right reason. And you, it is a it is, as I said, a disposition. Um, if, if you think about open-mindedness like that, um, it means that it can't be a virtue if you say, well, it's all about saying, uh, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just wrong about this. Like any, you, you have sort of this ironic stance towards all of your beliefs. That, well, that can't be right, okay? So functionally, it's impossible because you have to take certain things for granted. And furthermore, it seems like it could be harmful to think that, you know, it's an open proposition that um, maybe, maybe rape's a good thing. You know, I mean, I'm sorry to choose an example like that, but you know, you choose, it, it's, it's an extreme example. Like these things aren't good for people to think. Um, and it's no way to proceed as a moral agent in the world. Um, another way to think about open-mindedness would be like, well, I just, I, I'll, I'll kind of remain neutral on everything. This kind of, I think I call it kind of a principled non-judgmentalism. Like I'm just kind of, you know, I'm not saying I, I'm ironic about it. I just, I just don't know. It's, it's kind of epistemic agnosticism. This too seems to me both impossible to live and undesirable. And so far as we want to flourish as human beings, we are going to take certain things to be true, right? Um, so that that can't be right either. Um, and so I, I sort of proceed in the book by trying to kind of set up and then I guess knock down um, various uh, candidates for a definition of open-mindedness. And finally, I, I come down on one that is, for those who read Aquinas, it sounds a little bit like studiousness, right? So Aquinas thinks there's this virtue called studiousness, which you contrast with curiosity, interestingly enough. So these days you send kids to kindergarten, teachers are like, well, make them curious. You know, we say that's a good thing. Um, and, you know, I guess it kind of is the way they mean it, but uh, Aquinas saw, and I think he's correct about this, that um, any sort of um, um, appetite, intellectual appetite, desire to know things, needs to take into account what things are proper for a human being to know, right? So there is an answer to the question, what happens when you take DNA from a cow and mix it with DNA from a human being, right? And a really curious person would say, like, I really want to know. Like this is the this is the mad scientist, right? And that would be 
curiosity that the medievals would say is a vice. That's not a virtue. Um, there, that is information, right? And um, um, Aquinas and Augustine even goes as far as to say, it's the, the curious person hates that he doesn't know that thing. It's not actually for love of knowledge, right? So there's something bad going on there. We contrast with studiousness, which is like, these are the things God wants us to know. And I'm going to commit myself to a, a sort of the, the labor, and it's a labor of love, of coming to know those things more deeply, okay? And I sort of think about open-mindedness in this way, and, but what I accent in it is that it's, it's a kind of a, a broadness of mind as well, right? So that you are willing to be open to learning from as wide a possible audience of people, um, um, texts, and, and, and so forth, right? So I'm not gonna rule out that there's something to be learned from that, okay? And I think that this is a disposition um, that naturally leads to the environment of intellectual diversity. So when you are an open-minded person, you are going to find yourself naturally sort of surrounded by um, books where people are challenging you, right? And um, people who don't necessarily share your views. Um, I, the philosophers might use the word super mean, like it super means, but it's not like I'm saying, I really want viewpoint diversity. Um, it's saying like, because I'm open-minded, that's just naturally gonna result. Uh, and uh, what the, the position I take on intellectual diversity in that book is not one that anybody who's taken my classes would guess that I would take uh, because I, I preach, you know, like my, my syllabi, like at the top, you know, they're, you know, Kind of epigrams from uh, John Stuart Mill and you know these kind of ways of thinking about uh, let's let's hash it out let's let's have a marketplace of ideas um, and I, and I, I don't mean to say that I'm, I'm being disingenuous there I, I think um, in our modern university um, this is one way to create um, some space uh, for people to be open-minded um, and and therefore I, I guess I find it kind of useful. Uh, in the end, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, and this is what might surprise people if they actually read the book, about these sort of utilitarian arguments for if you put all these things together, naturally the best idea is going to emerge, right? So there, there are generally some kind of analogies or metaphors in the background that are making people believe that. So one is, as I said, kind of marketplace idea. It's like, like you have this commercial marketplace, and then... Um, Things are being bought and sold and like who has the best product at the best price and I, i'm not sure that's how we come to believe in ideas and i'm not sure that much like businesses you don't end up with monopolies that can control things <laughs> and um i think also that the kind of darwinian metaphor of well just like it's a survival thing that the right ideas will survive i'm not sure i believe that either um and so i finally come down upon saying like you it's, it's natural that you would find this sort of thing when people are being intellectually virtuous, when they're open-minded, when they're intellectually charitable, when they're intellectually humble, you're gonna find this kind of diversity of views. Now, this leads to the additional question of like, well, if you're a Christian community, like how much of that do you want? Right? And so there's this, there's, you might say, well, that's, um, there are certain ideas we don't want present in our school because we are a Protestant or Catholic or you know, Jewish or Muslim school. Um, and so I think this is where it gets kind of tricky. Um, and, you know, I began the book by trying to kind of answer this challenge that secular people have, usually secular liberal people have towards religious people. And they say, the problem with you all is that you're closed minded, right? And you won't entertain alternative viewpoints. You're dogmatic. And that's what makes us better than you. And we're open minded. And I, I, I've long thought that like there was, this is just completely wrong. Um, not just because people who say that often seem very dogmatic and closed-minded themselves, which is a fair point, but also because I don't actually think religious people are that way. And I don't think of myself as that way and I'm religious. Um, and so the question is like, how, how do you take what's good about open-mindedness and viewpoint diversity and fit it within a Christian tradition? And, you know, finally, and, and 
by the way, I think any dissertation that I've known doesn't in the end like solve all the questions it poses. Uh, uh, and I, I didn't either. Um, but what, what, I, what I did finally conclude is that there, there is a certain character or form to a Christian school, right? There are certain things you regard as true that are axiomatic that secular schools don't, right? And, and I think they're kidding themselves and thinking that they don't have things that are axiomatic too. I think they are, there's secular things, but there are. So in that sense, it's going to constrict a little bit what we, what we would regard as kind of a healthy um, intellectual diversity, but only for the sake of something greater. Um, you know, I think in order for conversation to be productive, you have to agree upon certain terms. Like if everything's just totally open to interpretation, um, it's, it's hard as a, as a university to say, okay, what is it we're actually doing here? Like in this field of study, uh, the analogy I use that I borrow from somebody is, you know, you come to play baseball, you have to agree on the rules of the game. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very good game. And you're going to be arguing the whole time, right? So I think Christian education is a little bit like this too. Um, so, you know, you might say, I, so I, I don't know, do I go back on what I said earlier in the book? I, I think it's, um, I think it's tricky. And I think this is one place where faith makes a difference. Okay. And then in the, the final chapter of the book, um, which if you think like an Aristotelian, or I'm sorry, a Thomas, um, you would say that's actually where you start, right? Like, where, where do you think you're supposed to end up? And that tells me what should be the shape of your moral life view. Um, and so if you're an Aristotelian, it's like, what's a flourishing life? Um, I was actually, I, was, I caught an ad, I was watching something on the internet, it was an ad for this uh, master class, which is like, I don't know, people on YouTube are really, really good at what they do. And, and they said like, I'm gonna teach you all in 20 minutes how to do it. And there was this author, James Patterson, I've never heard, but you know, he's presumably he's famous. And he said, I, I, I get uh, questions from young writers, aspiring writers, and like, I don't know how to start a story. And I, I, that's where I, I can't get out of the gate. And he said, well, tell me, decide how you want the story to end. And then, then the beginning will come to you. And I tell my students, and I teach in a secular environment, and, and you know, I, I, can, I can't preach Christianity per se, but I, I can at least get them to take seriously their moral lives. And I, I say, tell me how you think what a good life would look like looking back uh, at the end, okay? And that's gonna give some shape to it. So if you are uh, a Christian, you might take this a step further and say, tell me what heaven should look like or would look like, or you think looks like, based on your faith tradition and what scripture says. And then reverse engineer it and say like, well, how should we be living our lives here? Uh, in other words, what would open-mindedness as a virtue look like in light of that? How would we regard our intellectual appetite generally or what we think of diversity generally in light of that? And so in a way, you might think about this in terms of types of causation, efficient material, right? So the final cause, I mean, the purpose is the cause of all causes. So if you think this way, like your last chapter should be pulling the whole book. And, and I think in my case, that's kind of how I did it. Um, and, and so I'm in thinking about what heaven is or should be, I, I reasoned, um, I guess that you might say speculated, uh, that uh, heaven, if you're... Christian should be a place where there is no more disagreement. Um, everyone agrees because all truth is known. And open-mindedness as a virtue um, ceases to be necessary. So Augustine thinks all the other, all virtues go away except for charity. So you don't need to hope anymore, right? Because the thing is realized, right? There's no more faith because you see face to face. Um, but charity, he says, waxes all the greater. You don't need any of the other virtues. They're unnecessary. So I think open-mindedness clearly is, is like this, right? So why, why would I need open-mindedness anymore as a virtue? Um, and I say, similarly, I think um, viewpoint diversity goes away too. We're all of one mind. Uh, we all agree. And so there's no more debate about like, you know, who's right about the relationship between nature and grace. I mean, this just seems unimportant, right? Um, and I, I take one more step or speculate yet another step and, and the same, um, maybe, um, 
disagreement itself is a consequence of the fall. Um, that prior to sin, um, he, there actually was no disagreement. If you, you can actually read the Genesis account this way, right? That there, everybody was of more in mind, including Adam and Eve with each other, right? And, and, and disagreements emerge as a consequence of the fall. And you might even say, and, and this is something I think about when I teach my classes on polarization or um, political difference, that if that's right, then maybe one of the reasons we so dislike disagreement as human beings is that it was never natural to us in the way that death was never natural to us. So you can use the word natural in different ways, right? And you can say like, well, this is the most natural thing in the world, we all die. Uh, but it, you might say it's unnatural in that that's actually not how God intended and that's not ultimately how things are going to be. So if that's right, it would actually maybe shed some light on why we, we get so frustrated and like, we wanna be, we wanna agree, right? Cause it's like, that was natural. This was never supposed to be like this. And we, we get, you know, upset. And so, you know, I speculate like, you know, in heaven, uh, there's no more disagreement, right? And um, all minds are blessedly closed. Uh, we don't need open-mindedness anymore. Um, and so having tried to figure out in what sense it is a virtue and defended it, I then say, and then we don't need it anymore. Um, and so that's sort of in a nutshell, what I was trying to do in the book. And um, I now teach these classes, as I said, where, you know, I, I kind of preach viewpoint diversity and my students, you know, they, obviously they don't read my book, they don't have time to. Um, and, and they might be a little bit scandalized by what I say in it, but I, I don't think it fundamentally contradicts kind of what I'm doing in the classroom. I think in the end, I'm, I'm trying to instill in them uh, certain intellectual virtues. And, and by the way, I mean, that, that itself is an interesting category. Maybe we'll go into that. Uh, Jenna, you had some questions for me. Uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? My, should uh, we go into question? Great. You're doing great. Should, um, yeah. Um, I don't want to steal material from the questions other than to say uh, um, this, this category that I'm calling intellectual virtues, I'm, I'm playing, I'm kind of playing fast and loose with, and, you know, in the tradition generally, there's this, this distinction made and there's like, you know, there's wisdom and understanding. And then there are what we think of as virtues or the moral virtues. Right. Um, I mentioned, you know, um, temperance, fortitude, and so on. And then there's prudence. This, this, this is like this go-between thing that right, can help you make sort of intelligent choices about how to you know, go about saying, doing the moral thing and so forth, right? And then kind of what I'm doing in the book is, is just trying to, I'm playing a little bit on this, is, is, is say like, well, if you think more about humility or charity or these kinds of virtues, like what do they look like in the mind like when you're actually thinking? Um, and I try to maybe question a little bit this idea that, um, being a, a moral person doesn't do anything to your intellectual, I, let me back up a little step. I mean, so on the one hand, you, you would say like being a, being a, uh, a smart person doesn't make you a better person, right? Cause we. And I'll think of people, right? Like immediately come to mind. That guy's really smart, total jerk. It's got nothing to do with it. And you might, you also probably know people who um, don't have high IQs who are very good people, um, right? And so you say like, well, what's the connection between the two? Um, and maybe as a Christian, you'd say there's absolutely none, right? Um, I, what I'm trying to do without disagreeing with that at all, I don't, I don't. Um, is to say, though, that maybe in developing um, these intellectual virtues, humility uh, of the mind, um, intellectual charity, and so forth, that we can become both better versions of ourselves and, and, and better thinkers, conversation partners. Uh, we can excel uh, in our quest for knowledge. And you might just say, well, all, all, you know, all you're saying there is, is that they're, um, um, those are just like good habits of the mind. Um, but in the end, you wouldn't call somebody good because 
maybe they have those or to the extent that they do all, all that is is just moral virtues and it's not actually what you would think about it like so i say fine and i'm not sure how much rides on the label i I'm, maybe i'm just trying to change the vocabulary a little bit um and i think um to bring this back to you know mission statement of james martin and so forth i think that these virtues are sorely needed right now in higher education and it's one place to begin when things have become so politically polarized that certain viewpoints get censored or people self-censor, they won't say what they think. I say, well, let's back up. What kind of classroom environment do you want? You want freedom of expression. I think my students do, I know they do. Um, don't you think um, that people who converse in this way or reason in this way and have these intellectual virtues are better versions of themselves. Don't you want to be that too? And so this, this language of intellectual virtue uh, is, is a kind of entry point uh, I've discovered in our you know, very tribalistic, secular universities like Duke. Um, and so that's, I guess, people say, what's the connection between this book you wrote and the classes you teach? That's it, um, in a nutshell. So I'll stop there and then- All right. Know. All right, thank you. And, and it's a perfect place to, to dive into the questions, because as you said, one of the first thing I wanted to talk about was intellectual virtues. And so I've heard you mention, obviously, open mindedness. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's the whole point of the book. Mm -hmm. I think you said wisdom, humility. Um, you know, what are what are the other intellectual virtues? And what's the like, what's the cutoff between an and and you, as you said, this is it's, yeah. it's right it's, area, right? But what's the difference between, you know, a, a, a virtue and just a good uh, a good habit to be in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, virtues are, are things that you might say perfect the soul. Uh, that's the language I use. You don't always find that in the Christian tradition. I mean, it's different than, um, you know, I have, I have good habits and bad habits when I play soccer. Um, you know, I don't, or when I play baseball, I don't keep my eye on the ball or whatever like this. You wouldn't say I'm a, a bad person or a good person in light of that. Um, but when I struggle with selfishness, um, that is something different going on there. And we recognize that as human beings. So we've changed categories um, from a sort of technical knowledge to, um, to moral character or dispositions of the will. And, and it's sometimes easier to give examples than to actually give you a, a, a super tight definition. And, and, I, and I think that's fine to work that way. I mean, Aristotle, who's sort of the, you know, where you often start if you do virtue ethics and talk you know, virtue in the university, uh, likes, likes examples right? and, and paradigmatic ones, especially of things going right or things going wrong. And we recognize what it means to flourish as a human being in light of, in light of that, right? And so we practice, and part of, part of habit is actually imitation. Um, so we kind of see how things are supposed to look. Uh, we have models. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes think that like uh, when I'm trying to teach uh, virtue in my students, really what I'm trying to do is to try to be a really virtuous person myself. So in my conversations with them, I try to be really even handed. Right. And when the student says something that a lot of people in the classroom know was cheap or I could, you know, slam that kid and embarrass him and I don't. And I and I try to instead respond in a way where I I give them I give them an out, but an out where it's like you're on my side, you know, and and I'm not gonna humiliate you. Um, I'm gonna try to find what's good in your comment and and we're gonna work together and is I'm not gonna engage in intellectual violence. Um, and this is, and we're going to work towards truth together. Students see that, and I'm not saying I always do that, right? <laughs> I have my vices too. But to the extent that I do, I, I think students see that, and then they say, I kind of like that. Like, I like being around people like that. I wish I were like that. Let's all do that. And that, that's sort of how virtue right. is spread. I mean, it, it also, it sounds like maybe some of those virtues have instrumental value at a university as well. Yes, they do. We'll get to those later when I talk about you know kind of the benefits for secular education. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's dive in a little bit more about intellectual humil humility and fallibilism. You have you have a whole chapter about that. Yeah. Um, 
And it, it's an argument. I like to make an argument when I'm defending great books. I like to quote C.S. Lewis. He says, every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all therefore need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. And that, I mean, that's, that is kind of a defense of open-mindedness in a certain area. Um, but, and, and the importance of being humble, but you say that fallibilism can go too far. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So the fallibilism is such tricky. You, you start thinking about this enough and you, you go down rabbit holes or you psych yourself out. Uh, because you begin to ask these philosophical questions about, like, well, why are we found? Like, what, um, on what basis do you, you say uh, we're, we're wrong about that? And if you dig deeper, it's always because of something else you regard as true. Uh, it's derivative. Um, so, so well, why that? Well, because past experiences show me. Well, how do you know you were wrong then? Well, here's why. Uh, and, and so you discover that... Um, what sometimes what we regard as doubt is really just deep down an expression of something we regard as true. Um, I so it's it's a bit tricky. I also think that um, and this is a, okay. So you know, to use the Lewis quote, there's something this the, 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 our age regards as true that isn't true, right? Um, you, I mean, that's a safe bet, right? There's, there are beliefs I have that are wrong. There are beliefs that we believe today that are wrong. Um, but I don't, at least let's just speak for myself. I don't know which ones those are. If I did, I wouldn't have them. I'd give them up, right? It's, right. I don't know who said it. It's to be mistaken is always a past tense thing. As soon as you realize you have, uh, you, you no longer hold that view, mm -hmm. right? And so you might say this is kind of an inert thing, like, what difference does it make to say that there's some something I regard as wrong? I can still change my mind about things without following, believing that sort of fallibilism makes a difference because I'm, I can see that there's more to be learned and that more may require me to question or revise what I currently regard to be true. So there's actually this back to yet a deeper conversation about what are we doing when we quote unquote change our mind? Um, and this is a bit actually within like, you know, like can the Catholic church, the tradition change, right? And some Catholics are like, it doesn't, it doesn't change. When things change, when traditions change, um, you might just say they merely become better versions of themselves. They always have within themselves the resources to say, but that doesn't make sense in light of this, right? Or this, this part, is more important than that and here's why and therefore we need to say this um and that might be actually a better model for thinking about how all traditions work and how our own minds work and how our world works right so the the kind of quote unquote like total revolutions of thought like you thought you knew this and you were completely wrong, really actually if you deeper um in your own reason chain of reasoning or in history are there was something there that we look back on that made more sense and required us to jettison this and become, this is the new tradition, it's a revised tradition. Because things don't come from nowhere. They always come from somewhere. <laughs> and uh, so if you think about it like that, then the whole kind of conversation about like what, what work is fallibilism doing, you might say, actually not much. All it is is just this reminder that there's something there we're probably wrong about. Yeah, I already knew that. What difference does that make? Um, so I, I might be wrong. I mean, it's terribly ironic for me to say, maybe I'm wrong about that, but maybe I'm wrong. Reminding <laughs> me of Donald Rumsfeld and his unknown unknowns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay, so on a different topic, so religion in general and the church in particular have gotten a reputation, whether deserved or not, and you can address that for squelching intellectual diversity and dissent. Sure. And does that mean that open-mindedness is a new virtue or an undiscovered virtue or uh, how would you address that? Yeah, so, you know, I don't, I don't know who said it once, um, um, bar the way of heresy and what results is orthodoxy. Uh, like it's actually quite useful 
to figure out what are the heretical views because then then you're like what's left is probably something close to orthodoxy um and so this isn't such a bad thing that as a christian tradition we uh we rule certain things out i mean i i think there's a difference between saying that's not what the tradition thinks right and so our starting point is something else and the difference between that and saying that in the course of my uh reasoning right i won't address that argument i mean you think about like a finance he begins by saying here are five reasons why what i'm going to tell you is right looks wrong um and i think that's a really healthy exercise um and so i i think that um the other thing to say is that just because um it it, it because Christianity has, or Christian tradition, or, or Christian institutions have made mistakes in this, um, somehow um, disqualifies them as being um, a proper site for, you know, these uh, virtues being exemplified, right? I mean, like, all traditions get things wrong, right? And so, you know, you think about Galileo or whatever, right? So, um, such things were unfortunate. Um, but I think that, um, if uh, these Christian, uh, you know, you take Notre Dame University or like whatever, right? So I think that one thing about um, taking certain things for granted is that it allows for a kind of in-depth study, right? Or a kind of uh, a mutual project with people who have certain shared premises and you can work together. That wouldn't be possible if you just said like, every all propositions starting points are on the table like that actually becomes a much less interesting institution right so i think i think it's fine for religious institutions to to proceed this way uh you know and, and i also kind of have a sense that i think all traditions sooner or later end up with a little bit of that i mean i think about what goes on in secularly higher education and it it is uh you know, this is uh, orthodoxy is optional sooner or later we prescribe. Uh, I think there's something to this. Uh, we kind of come up with our own dogmas and, and they become our guiding vision. So, uh, but I, so, but, but I think that whatever it is, it needs to, it needs to maintain, it need, it needs to be producing minds that are open-minded, right? And it needs, there needs to be some viewpoint diversity present in order for that to function as a healthy uh, university, I guess what that's saying. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to skip ahead in my questions because I think you just is an excellent, excellent segue. You talked about having a mutual project, and I think that uh, universities, even secular ones, uh, on paper have a mutual project of the discovery of truth, the dissemination of truth, um, and uh, you know, the preservation of truth. And maybe your book has something to teach them there. Um, and maybe the kind of the rules of the game are different for a secular, secular university, but some of those virtues that you mentioned uh, maybe should be a rules of the game at secular universities. So and it, civil discourse comes to mind. Um, and some people are trying to throw it out. But um, so what, what, do you think that a secular university or any really educational institution can take from your book and apply? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, oh, maybe it would take from it that that where the view, the intellectual diversities are absent, that the joint project towards the pursuit of truth will sooner or later be harmed, that you can't completely separate those things. That if we have people who are intellectually vicious, that our scholarship and our class discussions and all the rest will suffer. Um, that we can't just bracket the question, are we making good people? Um, mm -hmm. you, 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 you are more likely to achieve your goal of truth um, if you can create humility in these young minds uh, of the right kind. Um, and I think that a lot of what people are doing when they're making calls for civil discourse is trying to remind 
uh, people um, at universities that they um, are liable to forms of intellectual pride, uh, of bullying, of, of, of a kind of arrogant groupthink um, that is in the end antithetical to the very institutions that they are leading, are, are part of. Um, now, it shouldn't be surprising that sometimes these calls for civil discourse are met with skepticism these days, right? So the, the, the argument is, well, why, why should we allow that viewpoint in, right? Um, it's offensive, it's harmful. Well, uh, yeah, says you, uh, but, but the question is, um, um, are you, is it fair of you to dismiss out of hand a view that people of, of good mind and uh, goodwill have? Uh, you know, some of my students, uh, I'll, I'll say to them, um, you know, you regard something as dangerous, I said, but consider the following thought experiment. Suppose that the faculty of Duke University was uniformly pro-life. And I said, I know some of you that you just can't imagine such a world. Um, I said, but I mean, wouldn't it by their logic follow that the, the pro-choice position uh, whether it's present in the, on their syllabi or, um, you know, who they hire, you know, to say you can figure out what they think on this, that that would be a dangerous point of view. I would have net really serious consequences. And I said that would make, that would be completely valid philosophically argument. And I, and I said, and so you, would they be warranted, right, in declaring this position dangerous and therefore suppressing it? Well, my students are horrified at the thought of this. <laughs> I said, so how is that any different than, than you saying, you know, this view or that view is dangerous? Um, we're really being inconsistent on this, right? So um, if, if a kind of um, uh, a commitment to these sort of I, I, what I call classical liberal uh, uh, values is, um, is supposed to be what we're about, then, then we ought to practice it all the time. Um, you know, I was, it was just the other day, I, I was reading something and, and a, a woman was kind of being dismissive of somebody who was, she said, hiding behind um, the, the right to academic freedom. And she wrote academic freedom in scare quotes. And I thought, now what's the difference between academic freedom and scare quotes and not the scare quotes? I'd sure like that explained because uh, I think there's just one kind. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it'd be interesting to know. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll go back a little mm -hmm. bit and back to religious institutions. So a lot of universities, including Duke, mm -hmm. uh, started as religious institutions yeah. and have you know drifted away from that tradition mm -hmm. and a lot of them duke i think has kind of officially drifted away from that tradition but some have you know they they still claim to be catholic institutions or protestant institutions yeah. and you know they still have a chapel on campus but it's it's kind of in name only yeah. um, are there ideas from your book that could help them kind of reintegrate religion in, in, into the intellectual life at those institutions I, you know, I don't address that in the book, but I, I would say that if universities are made up of people who are open-minded, then they should not sequester um, religious voice, or you might say they should not make an enclave out of their divinity schools. Um, they should not be um, embarrassed to have classes called Christian ethics which is what I teach and no one else would ever teach, um, um, likely. Um, so I think that part of, part of being intellectually virtuous and having kind of a healthy ecosystem of the mind is to not be, first of all, prejudiced towards um, whatever traditions maybe some of us don't like, um, but to be uh, open to them, letting them be participants in the communal life of our universities. And so if that were the case, I think it would naturally follow that, um, you know, groups and um, schools of divinity um, 
would all would all seem a bit more integrated into university life. I mean, the, the history is as you describe it, Jenna. I mean, it was, these were you know deeply religious institutions. You know, some of them founded in order to train ministers in some cases, right? And then there's this sort of long, slow process of secularization that was accompanied by a kind of taking religion out of the center of it. Letting, it's no longer the glue that holds it together, but now it's just kind of over there and keep to yourself, right? Right. And, and even the way you study that has to be in a, in a kind of, don't assume faith, right? If you got to study it like an anthropologist or something like that. So <laughs> we've like completely removed religion uh, and right. in particular Christianity uh, from these schools in a way that is, um, if you look back at the history, it's amazing that uh, how, how far that's gone. Um, we still have on our uh, school crest a cross, but I'm told that there somebody saw one recently where they've taken it off. So that'll be that'll be the next one. They won't announce it, you know. So that'll just right. happen. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, the chapel's still there. At the center. you can't get rid of that. Um, right. But and, and I understand it still has services, so it's not it's not 100 percent gone, right? What's that? I said that there are still services at the chapel too, right? Yes, yes, there are. There are. <laughs> active, <laughs> active. Rid of that. <laughs> and of course, we still have the divinity school right there. But, you know, it's, um, but, you know, you even think about that. And I can say this as, as an alum at the divinity school, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's kind of an enclave. You know, part of it is that you're there are professional schools and then, you know, undergraduates. But even so, um, you know, there, there, there isn't just much go between. Uh, there and I and I think part of that is this kind of religious secular divide. Even though many many of the students are religious, right? But even they, um, I don't say they feel like an enclave too. I mean they and I, you know I just taught a class of Christian ethics and I I pull the students anonymously. You know those of you who are religious, like do you you know how do you feel and 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 they do often feel like they're the weird kids on campus. You know um, and so they they talk about matters of faith to each other. Right? And if they try to evangelize or reach out, that doesn't always go so well, which tells you something too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so my last question for you before we right. open it up to the audience is, you know, what advice can you give to Christian students and Christian scholars um, on a secular campus, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, like Duke or like, you know, a public university? Yeah, find community. Um, wherever you are, uh, there's there's at least one other person. I mean, <laughs> there are probably a dozen, 20, 30, uh, um, and find them and and um, you know engage in, in in conversation with them, um, dinners, whatever, and that'll as you so that you don't feel like you're the crazy one. Um, and I think that also, I I say this. So it can be it can be disheartening sometimes, and and I try to keep in mind Mother Teresa's uh, words that as Christians we're called um, to be faithful, not successful. Success is God's business, and um, you know there are times I just think like I'm just not getting anywhere. Right, this is too hard. And um, is this even as a Christian? Is this like you know? the best sort of life for me you know i don't know shouldn't i be shouldn't i be someplace where there are more christians and people who are more like-minded and then you know I'm, this is what god's called me to do at this moment and all i can do is be faithful um and um just reminding yourself of that um can make navigating very secular places filled with people who probably don't share your views um, much, uh, it, it makes it look different, right? Um, I'm not here, I, I can't like completely change Duke right, on my own. Um, my job is just to be faithful and maybe change something for, yeah, so, so I get discouraged someday and I tell my wife, oh, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm doing anything and da da da. And she says, well, you know, you, your job isn't to change 20% of the campus, You're, you can change that one kid and make 100% of it for that one kid, right? And that itself is a big thing. Um, and so you keep, you think about it like that, it changes, changes, changes how you see things. So that's my, that's my advice and pray, always pray. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience now. And I'm gonna start with one that came in a little while ago. 
um, from our friend Ed. Hey, Ed, how are you? Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, he says, I believe in intellectual diversity too, but don't there need to be some limits? Should we discuss, for example, whether racial superiority is a tenable view or slavery? Or should we discuss those views that are less worthy than other views? Yeah, yeah. This is something I address in my book. And, and I say, um, this is, I agree with him, we shouldn't. Um, um, it's interesting to think about the fact that Lincoln debated Douglas about the possible expansion of slavery into the new states, new territories. So you ask, well, why? Why did he do that? And that it was because Lincoln was fallibus about his view. No, he he believed that slavery was a great moral sin, no question. Um, he did it because he had to because half the country still thought that and he needed to persuade them. And so he debated him like a gentleman, unlike John Brown, who just went and, and tried the other method. Um, and so I, I think that um, we don't have to debate that anymore, right? I think, I think everybody gets that, it's unnecessary to do so. I mean, the other thing, so I, I tell my students like you can offer up views in my class um, if of goodwill and um, yeah, in the spirit of charity and humility. Like you can you can say whatever you think, and then I get this question: What if? And this is Ed's example. Always, always a, what if somebody said uh, it will maybe racial superiority? And my response is nobody ever has, and nobody ever will. Um, like you know, I've, I've now heard. 4,000 student questions in, in the last five years or comments. And nobody actually thinks that. So it's a little bit of a boogeyman. Um, I think that it kind of takes care of itself. Um, that student doesn't exist at Duke. And if he did, he'd never ask it. Um, and, and I don't ask it in the class. I ask the questions that are live ones. Um, and, and therefore, uh, so I, I just think that kind of takes care of itself. I don't, I mean, that's like a non-answer. Mm -hmm. So, but so there, yeah, there are there are views that don't do not deserve a seat at the table for sure, right? Um, but I think in in cases where I mean, I I signed a piece by um, a uh, legal scholar named Michael Paulson, and he you know he says um, you know racial superiority uh, is you know is a flat Earth view, but he thinks the pro-choice position is a flat Earth view, and he says, but we just the, the world doesn't hasn't realized it yet, but someday it will. Uh, and in the meantime, we pro-lifers have to debate them in a spirit of civility. Now, when my students read that, who are like almost all pro-choice, they're they're just shocked. And I say, but yeah, but of course you'd think that. Like if you know, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> there's this view that you all take for granted that's completely wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I've got another one. Just came yeah. in uh, from Clifford. It seems to me that the idea the, that institutions can be neutral on questions of morality and religion is based on a false anthropology, one that assumes human beings can cease to be human beings when it comes to questions that are, at their heart, humane in the truest sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a better model for society is a federation of institutions that each have a stance on the nature of truth and morality so that intellectual diversity takes place not on the individual level but on an institutional level could you comment on that thought uh, that's such a great Clifford that's a great set of questions I I so I'm looking here I'm reading it myself I okay. I think that um you're absolutely right that these institutions cannot in the end be truly neutral on questions of morality, or I would say religion. I think because it is built into human nature, like that is what we do. We sort of, we congregate, um, we need a kind of shared vision of the good life. Um, and even in when we say, no, 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 as kind of modern liberalism says it does, we're gonna suspend those questions of anything that is, is good. Um, sooner or later they kind of emerge, but they emerge in ways that we don't immediately recognize them as these sort of shared moral virtues. So I think um, 
you know, I think, I think the way we extol, um, speaking of diversity, but I mean, this not in viewpoint, diversity, but diversity um, on campus or tolerance or things like this, I think they've kind of become kind of virtues or shared goods in the way and function much like um, what, you know, Aristotelians would have thought other virtues would, would do um, or other basic goods for a Thomist. Um, and I think that that's kind of natural. Um, and, and so the question is, you know, can those, are those going to be able to um, uh, sustain universities, right? And, and I guess that remains to be seen. I, I can imagine, you know, somebody uh, who believed in those things hearing me say this and say, absolutely, you're right. And, and they will. And these, this is kind of our new, you know, let's say lowercase r religion. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, that's possible. Um, and then the second part of the question was, um, oh, a better model society. Yeah. So what if they were just, maybe the question you might say, wouldn't this be a better society if these institutions were just explicit about that? So this is, you know, this is kind of our creed, if you want to say, and then over there, there are the, there's the evangelical college, and then there's the, this, college. um, I think one reason they this won't happen is because these secular institutions are not supposed to uh, do that. Um, that is, if they were to say, you know, we are kind of religious and own that, uh, then there would be a lot of conservatives who would say, aha, we've been saying this the whole time and you never admitted it. You, you forced us out because you said we had to be, you know, that we were the dogmatic ones. And now you've admitted that you've just created, there was a guy named L. Eisenhock who wrote a book called The Next Religious Establishment in which he said like, no, we really do need like we secular liberals, we need like another religious establishment, that's what we're doing. And people were like, you can't say that, right? And, and like, you let the cat out of the bag. Um, but, and, and he himself as a secular liberal thought like, no, of course, that's what we need. Like, you can't have, um, you know, the wasps went away, we have a new establishment, but you, we have to create and it kind of functionally kind of something more like a religion um, in order to be the ruling class and for the people to respect us and say, you should be our rulers and your institutions are the ones that make good people and should be the basis of society. Um, and so you know, what if we just had that? I don't know that we ever will uh, explicitly. Um, I, think, I, I, I think that we still um, want to think of our universities as places where and, and this is what I want them to be, um, the secular universities, where these sort of classical liberal principles are still the thing that um, make it so that a kind of, of, of um, bad kind of dogmatism can never rule, right? Because you always say, no, 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 people have freedom of speech, you have freedom of inquiry, university professors can put what they want in their syllabi, like, so as long as you have that, you're never going to have anything that's that's you know too uh, dogmatic, and so the question is: Will will the universities um, stick to that, and maintain that? I mean, it remains, it remains to be seen. Yeah, I'll follow up on that one with one of my own. Is that I'm sure you've heard of the new University of Austin that's been announced, and they said you know their dogma is radical adherence to freedom of inquiry, to freedom of speech and expression. Um, to civil discourse, to all the things we've been talking about. Um, yeah. And do you think it it's a, that they can can keep it, essentially? They start with that. Can they keep it? So knowing few of the people involved in that project, I, I'd say they will. Uh, they can. Um, those people are, are committed. I, I, I think it's interesting that such a university is needed. I mean, I, I guess I'd start there. It's like, why, why in the world do we need this? We have all these amazing universities and they are amazing when you consider the, the, how many smart people they have and the equipment in their labs and the gigantic endowments and super smart students who are all trying hard to try hard to get in. Like, why in the world do we need another university? Right? On the face of it, it seems strange, right? Yep. But it's only when you stop and consider that we have these other problems where there, there isn't civil discourse happening. 
um, where there is a ton of, of self-censorship and why are people self-censoring, right? For fear of penalty, um, where increasingly it feels to a lot of people, not just conservatives, uh, not just religious people, that there is this kind of new dogma. I mean, Barry Weiss is speaking here at Duke tonight, and uh, I'm sure she's gonna talk about this, um, that feels like it's anti-intellectual, right? Um, it's because of all of those things that you get a response like the University of Austin, right? I mean, in another day and age, that would just seem like so strange. Like, why would you? And I think um, I think it's good that they, they're started. I, I, I hope it succeeds. Um, I think the, the issue, of course, is that um, given the kind of the way the power structures work in our society today, um, it's the, the degree from Duke gets you the good job, which then, the, you know, so, and so the fear of kind of cancellation is a part like, what if I don't, what if somehow this knocks me off the track to being the really successful person I want to be? Um, and so for those who are committed to uh, freedom of speech and higher education to really create a kind of parallel track, they need to be thinking about like, how do we still get, because because if you create a place where um, um, I said, you, can't, you can't end up in a situation where you give these kids a great education and then when they go to apply to PhD programs, they're black because, oh, University of Austin, right? You're like Ave Maria, you're like Liberty, you're, we, you people are nuts and we're not having you. Uh, you can't have that situation, right? So how do you create? And right. when you start thinking about this, Jenna, you start realizing like, how, this is actually bigger than the universities. This mm -hmm. sort of power structure right now. That's how, like, that's why the fear of cancellation works in part. It's, it's like you, but then the next step, you can, that can follow you, right? So there's almost no way around it, right? So really what you're trying to do is, is, is carve out places in our society and in our professional world where mm -hmm. you can have people get this education and maybe even publicly say, I think this, this is true for academics too. Mm -hmm. And, 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 or a business say, we're gonna do things this way and it not be the case that other businesses or other punish them in a way where, oh my goodness, like you can't say that, right? So it's a big, it's a society-wide issue, right? You gotta see the whole thing. Yeah, that actually, it's, it's, it relates to one of the questions that I'm sure you see. Uh, right. Do you think you're gonna get canceled or not be able to get tenure? Ah, uh, yes. So I- What you're saying. I, <laughs> I get asked this question like three times a day by students. Uh, they're like, I love your class. Aren't you worried that? And uh, so I'm, I'm not tenure track here. Um, maybe I will be someday. I'm not yet. And, and, and I think for that reason, I, I, there's a little less scrutiny in what I'm do. I like all the students know about my classes. That's gotten uh, very well known, uh, better known than I want it to be. Um, but I haven't received the kind of scrutiny uh, that you would you would say. Well, then you're you're never gonna. They're not gonna renew your contract. Um, so on the contrary, I, I mean, I think that um, I think that there are some you know administrators who I think are very supportive of viewpoint diversity. Um, and, and hear from their alums. Alums are really gonna play a key role in this. And I don't know if you've been hearing these stories about like right. MIT alums saying like, we're not gonna give any more money, right? And, um, and that's very smart. If you're an alum in a university and you're committed about the, to concern about this stuff, you shouldn't give any money to like general, you should ask your universities like, what, where in your university are you doing civil discourse? And then I'll earmark my money and give it to that, okay? Um, and if you're not, I'm not gonna give any money. Um, I, I think that's really smart. Um, so I, you know, I, have, I haven't gotten in trouble yet. I, um, I suppose that day could come, and if it comes, <laughs> I'll go back to Mother Teresa. <laughs> My job is to be faithful, not to be successful. And uh, you know, I never thought I'd be here teaching these classes at Duke, and here I am, um, having an impact. And I, my wife, uh, you know, she said, if I, if you get canceled for something. Um, like you really shouldn't have said that I'll be upset with you but if it's something that is often the case you know it's, it's really unfair that somebody 
is punished professionally for something they said, right? She said, well, it doesn't matter to me, you know, and, and I guess uh, I only really care about my wife's opinion anyways. So right. I have that, I have that sense and mm -hmm. so I don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Um, it reminds me, it, I think the, the, it, the issue of cancellation, you mentioned MIT, Dorian Abbott up there. And I think that, you know, there has been a little bit of, there's been pushback, like you said, from alumni. Yeah. And I'm hoping that yeah. we'll do a lot to help address this issue where people are getting canceled for things that are just, uh, that they really should not be canceled for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I actually, um, uh, I'm having uh, Mr. Abbott uh, to campus on Monday. Um, I invited him. And uh, it's not a public speech, but I've organized a panel on the uh, politicization of the sciences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've invited some Duke faculty. So we're going to have a pretty interesting conversation uh, about what's going on in the sciences right now. Um, but I, 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 I mean, I do think um, that the, the cancellation stuff is real enough. I, you know, people, people say, oh, it's, it's a myth. It, it's not a myth if 68% of my students, when I pull them anonymously, say, I self-censor about certain political topics, even among my close friends, even among my close friends. And, and obviously, my, a lot of my conservatives, almost all my conservative students do it. But it's half my liberal students now. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're afraid, right? That, uh, that they're, you know, either it, it ranges from like socially ostracized, like, well, we're not going to be your friend. I thought I knew you, you know, kind of a thing, which really hurts. That's a powerful motivator. You can't downplay that um, um, to like, you know, something more serious, right? And then, and then your employer, potential employer, hears about what you said, right? Um, so I think, I think these are these are real concerns, um, and I. But I'm, I'm encouraged that alums are taking note. And I mean, they give money, so they have, they have power. They need to use it. Yeah, absolutely. We will, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Thank you to everyone who has attended. Thank you so much, John, for talking to us today. We will have this video up soon and I will be sure to share the link with everyone who is here, as well as it will be up on our website and on YouTube so it can be shared. Um, and again, we will have our next education book talk in February and information about that will be available soon. So thank you everybody and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks.